All right, you all asked for a redo of this topic analysis, so here is an update for 2017. Once again, we find ourselves arguing this April resolved the United States ought to replace the Electoral College with a direct national popular vote. So, so far, three times this year, the topic committee has given people a choice between one topic of known quality that was debated previous years or one questionably worded topic that hasn't been debated yet. And each time without fail, the community has so far picked the topic that has been debated before. We will see if that trend continues with the NSDA Nationals topic for this June. In the meanwhile, I can either go off on a tangent about how the three recycled topics were the three least bad topics this year, or I can dive into what makes it different now than it was last time it was debated. For the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and do the latter. So overall, this topic, one of the main concerns about it previously was that it seemed to be slightly pro-tilted in how the rounds played out. Fast forward four years, and that concern has only really gotten worse. It's worth noting that the way it's worded this time around does potentially allow the con side to argue opportunity costs in terms of any system other than a direct national popular vote that would be better to implement cannot be implemented once we switch to a direct national popular vote because a system like that is extremely hard to backtrack on. Once you give a country full democracy, it is very hard to get that country to vote away full democracy. It's much easier to move things in an incrementally more democratic direction. So something to keep in mind, because it might mean more squirrely counterplan-ish arguments that have a little bit more textual legitimacy this time around than several years ago. Other than that, using ought doesn't really change things around too much. We talked a lot last September, October, about how ought carries more of a moral dimension, but the moral dimension we're talking about what a government ought to do for its people is almost always based in practical results anyway. Nobody's saying it will happen, whether it is should or ought. The question is one of desirability. So I don't think that affects too much. What has changed, though, is there is a recent election that relies on it. When it was picked last time, it was more than a decade since there was an election that bucked the popular vote, and where the person who took the presidency ended up winning it on a 5-4 Supreme Court decision rather than on the majority of voters in the United States. That, however, seems like ancient history to somebody in 10th grade if it happened before they started first grade. This year, however, it happened during this school year. There was also some talk about it being a fluke and the electoral map actually favoring Democrats overall back when it happened in 2000. But now, if you look back over the last 24 years, if you look back over all the presidents since anybody debating in this tournament was born, it's a pretty clear trend. And that trend has gotten worse over years in terms of dividing along income, in terms of dividing along race, in terms of dividing along urbanization. So all of these things have been exacerbated slightly and it's generally seen as much more of a partisan issue now than it was four years ago. And the issue with that is twofold. First off, there's a direct link to arguments. It's a lot easier for a judge to go ahead and say, well, I don't buy that this party being good or this party being bad actually matters. What matters is my politics, whether or not they realize they mean to do it. It opens the door to judge intervention, not in terms of directly, okay, this would help Democrats, I'm against it. This would help Republicans, I'm against it. Nothing like that so directly, but it does mean that the sources arguing against the Electoral College that are current sources 
are almost always sources that lean towards one party and that judges with opposite political leanings tend to dismiss as non-credible sources. And vice versa, the sources arguing that the Electoral College is good and that we should keep it are very often the same sources that were vehemently condemning it in 2012 when it looked like Romney might win the popular vote. But the issue is that we have to go back to 1992 to see the last time that a Republican president took office for the first time while winning the popular vote instead of just the electoral vote. That makes things difficult if you want to try and run this in a non-political way. When the other team wants to make the debate political, they can. You will see more cases this time around arguing the Electoral College stops Democrats from being elected, Democrats in office is better for reasons X, Y, and Z, or the Electoral College makes it harder for Democrats to take office that's good for reasons A, B, and C. So those are going to be more prevalent this time around than they were in previous years. There's also more interaction with the year's previous topics this time around. The Electoral College gets rid of swing states, and swing states can pop up in some of the other topics we've had so far this year. In particular, for instance, let's look at the Cuba topic. Some teams who want to recycle the Cuba back files might go ahead and argue that Florida no longer being a swing state because swing states no longer existing is going to change our Cuban policy. Similarly, Ohio no longer being a swing state might change our ag policy. There are a lot of other arguments that can be made on that front with each varying swing state. Overall, the debate about more informed voters versus less informed voters, voters taking the job more seriously or not, turnout mattering more in terms of quantity or quality, aren't going to change too much since previous years. What is going to change is the accepted political ramifications of it and the amount of studies done on it since then generally being seen as, well, if you did a study and came to this conclusion, you must be a democratic hack. If you did this study and came to this conclusion, you must be working for the GOP. So overall, even the literature on it has gotten a lot more polarized than when the last time it had be actually been contentious was more than a decade in the past. When we are looking at this topic for TOC in particular, it changes a little bit. TOC is a lot more of a flow-centric tournament and style that the TOC even allows debate to progress in has changed since the last time this topic was debated. That creates a situation where certain strategies are more viable than they were before. I'm not even getting into theory as its own form of debate because we've always debated theory, we just haven't done it quite so explicitly signposted. What I do want to get into though is more along the lines of what the advantages of going second can do under more current evidence rules and with a more flow-centric judging pool. In particular, the way that con teams have been winning on this topic so far has been by going second. Going second and adding an overview that's actually new contention is probably not the best way. Going second and using your rebuttal to, rather than try to win the topic as a whole, turn your opponent's two best ways to win the topic does seem to have some kind of success and is going to be common here. This also means that arguments like democracy good, democracy bad, direct democracy good, representative democracy better, informed voters good, trying to judge whether inf voters are informed or not is bad, any of those are things that are ripe for arguing or turning, and I do think that the situation at TOC on this topic is going to allow con teams to get by with enough technical tricks to make up for the fact that their arguments generally have less lit and that lit that has recently gotten more polarized than the change in polarization of pro-lit. Khan is also still in a rough position because the Electoral College is not fulfilling its original purpose, but it's also not really showing the will of the people in the way that the Khan team usually would want to argue that it is. More so, 
when you're looking at how the Electoral College has changed between then and now, this was a first election where we had actual faithless electors and nothing really came of it in terms of how it affected the outcome, but we did have at least three candidates who did not finish in the top two in the election receive electoral votes. This could be a sign to some teams that the Electoral College is on its way out. And if that is the case, then that creates a compelling uniqueness narrative where the question becomes, what replacement should we have? Should we try to delay the replacement as long as possible? Is the replacement actually inevitable? Is the Electoral College more fragile? If it gets replaced, how will it get replaced? There are certainly arguments that either side can make about what mechanism would be replaced by and whether that is in and of itself good or bad. I don't think those are particularly winning arguments for either side. I think that if you specify a mechanism and say why it is bad, the other side will say why well, that is not a mechanism you should use. If you specify a mechanism and say it's good, the other side can try and turn that mechanism as well as the argument. But overall, I expect this to be a topic where the bias is not strong enough that teams will pick sides. Most teams are probably going to flip second. Teams who have to choose sides are probably still going to choose pro. The pro side is probably going to have a slightly higher win rate than it did the previous time this topic came around. Decisions are going to be more political in nature from judges, whether they realize it or not. And overall, the topic is going to create some interesting decisions when you have a diverse panel of judges in terms of how do I try to win all three of these when you've got different visions of what the event should be, how evidence should be used, and most importantly, what the second and third speeches in the round should be doing. It's going to be interesting times. If you have other questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Otherwise, I will see you all in Kentucky. Best of luck on the topic. Hope this follow-up helped.